We're jumping into to our, our week two of our love-hate relationship series. And so I'm really excited for this, but before we even dive into that, I just want to introduce myself to some of the sixth graders that didn't get to be here. Uh, my name's Chris. I'd be here earlier when we were like doing our thing. But my name's Chris, and I lead our middle school ministry, and really, really excited to get to know you guys, not only tonight, but over the next couple of months and years, and whatever that may look like for you guys, is that I am passionate about, about students, I'm passionate about you guys, not just sixth graders, but all of y'all. Um, and it is our heart as ministry, it's our heart as a ministry to, to help, you, help you guys know that this is a place where you guys are loved, that you guys are, are accepted, that you guys belong, and hopefully that you guys feel like you can be yourselves. We hope that this isn't a place where you feel like you have to hide or be somebody you're not. We really do. We want you, this to be a place where you guys are comfortable being you. And so that's going to start tonight, and I hope that if you're a sixth grader, you experience that for the first time, that you get that, and you know that that's something you can expect from us as a youth ministry, and that we are going to pour into you and love on you wherever you are and wherever you may go. So leading into that, that's going to kick us off into our, our love-hate relationship series. And so I think I don't have to explain to you guys what love-hate relationships look like, do I? I think we all experience them. Some of you guys may understand that with your siblings. Others of you guys may experience that with your parents or friends at school or teachers. I don't know about y'all, but like for me, I got two brothers. I have an older brother who's, who's five years older than me and a younger brother who's two years younger than me. And we, I love them to death. I will do anything for my siblings, but I can promise you we fight and have fought more than anyone you can imagine. Like growing up, especially me and my younger brother, being two years apart, we did everything together. And I can't help but tell you that we fought like crazy. We fought so much sometimes that literally, and he's always been bigger than me, bigger, stronger. Everyone thought I was the youngest brother. We got in a fight one time. They were both in middle school. He literally picked me up and threw me into our coffee table, shattered everywhere, no lie. He, we got so mad at each other, he shoved my parents lit into us. Let me tell you, like, they were so mad. Like, we, it was over the smallest stuff. But we love each other, but we fight. Another time, we got really mad at each other, and literally, I put his face up against the window. And I don't know, like, half of his face is on the window. The other half is up against, like, the wooden, like, ceiling or whatever. And it's, like, literally cut his face. And as it started bleeding, obviously, we stopped. and like, oh, shoot, I went too far, like, all that kind of stuff. But really, it cut so deep that he needed stitches. We're in middle school. Parents aren't home. It bled for hours. And so literally, he has scar. He has two scars down his face from us being stupid because of our love-hate relationship with another. But hopefully, you guys don't have such drastic, emotional, violent, like, relationships in your life. All that to say is, like, siblings can be tough. Relationships can be tough. And I know that, that that's true for all of you guys. But hopefully you also have some friends in your life that those relationships come a little bit easier, right? Hopefully you've got some friends that are just a little bit more natural. You've got some friends that you just have each other's backs no matter what. And so I want you to think about this. Have you ever had a friend who stopped a really embarrassing moment for you? Like you had something going on and they, were, they warned you and they said, hey, you might want to fix this before everyone laughs at you. I don't know if you've had that moment or not, but I can promise you I have. There have been countless times where I was in middle school and high school where I came walking out, or they're, they're just in scenarios where there's still like toilet paper like hung to your shoe, and you're about to walk back to the hallway, and you got toilet paper on you, and like, bro, that's embarrassing. Or girls, like imagine this, not just girls, all of you guys, but imagine you just got a boogie just hanging out of your nose, and you can swing that sucker so long left or right that you've got a friend who's like, yo, you got something in your nose. Like, thank, we, look, we are thankful for those people, right? We are glad that they are looking out for us and that they have our backs because that's gross. That's embarrassing. And we know that everyone in the lunchroom is going to be talking about it. Or it's like you've got something gross in your teeth. Girls, you're on a date and you've got the cutest boy that you're going out with and you've got something broccoli stuck in your teeth. That's gross. Or you've got bad breath. Guys, you've got bad breath and you are counting on your boys to say, bro, go brush your teeth. Go, here's a breath mint. Like, we need those peoples in our lives to save us from some embarrassment. But here's what I also know. I want us to think about the same concept of love-hate relationships in the same way that we're thinking about how we have people looking out for us. I want you to think about it this way. I'll flip it on its side and say, have you ever had a friend that you wanted to say something to, but you weren't really sure how, what to say or even how to say it? Right? It's like, it's one thing to tell someone that they got food stuck in their mouth, it's another thing to talk about things, like things a little bit harder. Things like this. Things like a friend, talking to a friend about a relationship that you know isn't good for them. Like, you girls, you protect your girlfriends. You protect your girls that you care about most, and when that guy comes into their life, you're like, he's bad news. What are you doing? And everyone else can see it, right? And you want to tell your friend, but you're not really sure what to say or how to say it. Or it may be about confronting someone about decisions they're making 
that everyone else sees isn't great for them. That doesn't have to be about relationships, but that can be about the way they treat their parents. That can be about the way they treat their siblings. That can be about the way they treat their friends or people at school who aren't even their friends. And you see the way your friend is treating all these people, and you're like, that's not you. Like, I want to call you out on it. I want to say something, but I'm not really sure what to say or even how to say it, right? Or it could be about speaking up about something that is going to get that other person in trouble. Like, you got a friend that's getting caught up in a bunch of stuff that's just going to take them down a path that's leading them into something nasty. And you really just want to say, hey, are you, sh-? like, that's, I don't know that that's what you should be doing. Like, but you're just not sure what to say or how to say it. Like, these conversations are a little bit different than telling someone they got a booger hanging out of their nose. That's just the reality. That relationships are hard, and speaking and confronting these people and these friends is even harder. And so, all together, we usually just avoid them, don't we? We usually, we, cause we avoid them, as I was thinking about them, we avoid them because we don't want to ruin a friendship or make someone mad. Because if you're like me, it's like, I care about my friends. I care about the relationships I have in my life. And I'm thinking, man, if I talk to them about this, they're going to they're gonna think I'm judging them. They're going to think that I, I'm thinking less of them. They're going to not want to be my friend because I'm different. Or, or it's this, that if I don't want to talk to this friend, is because I've done the same thing. I'm guilty of what they're caught up in. And so I feel like if I go talk to them, then I'm going to be a hypocrite. Or maybe I'm like, it's something I dealt with in my past. And so I'm like, I don't have a place to speak into this person's life because like, I'm doing the same stuff. Or we avoid these conversations because we just don't think the other person will listen, right? I mean, we just go, we think about our friends and we're like, I don't have that kind of influence on my friend's life. Like, I can, I don't, it doesn't matter what I go say to them, they're not going to listen to me. Why would they care about what I have to say? Or the lastly, like, we just don't know what to say or even how to say it. Those are reasons why we avoid the really hard conversations. And I know you guys understand that. But that's only about half of us. Only about half of us in the room probably fit in that category of like really hating conflict. Then there's another half that are like have no problem with conflict whatsoever. And I don't know where it comes from, but somewhere in your life you're like, man, I have no problem telling people how I feel. I have no problem telling people how they should live their life, what they should and shouldn't do, and I'm going to let them know how I feel. Some of you guys just have that gift, and I know that because I've had conversations with you. You just have a good opinion of how people should live. And so your problem isn't confrontation. Your problem is how you go about confronting people. And so in your confront confrontation, in your way of talking to people about what they should and should not be doing, what you end up doing is making enemies out of your friends. Because you don't need, these friends are like, I don't need someone to tell me what I should and shouldn't do all the time. We've all, like, we all know these people. This is the reality in which we live. But what makes this even harder for all of us, regardless of which, like, kind of the side of the court that you're on, is that our culture and our society makes this even harder on us. And I mean that this way is because there's these sayings that are preached at us constantly. Hey, you do you. You go live your life however you want. Who am I to judge? Right? We've all heard these things that are like, Hey, you can do what you want, with whomever you want, how much you want, wherever you want, however many times you want. Like, it goes on and on, and there's no end to this thing. And as long as it doesn't impact you personally, then you have no place to say anything into that person's, other person's life. That's what's preached in our community, in our society, in our world, because we are so afraid of hurting somebody's feelings or being judged. And so I just want you to ask this question to yourself. Is that true? Do you not have a say in, what other, in other people's lives? Especially as Christians. As Christians, do you not have a say? Do the decisions your friends make really matter? And if they do matter, should you say something? And what I love about this, this love-hate relationship series that we're going to break out into Scripture right now is that Paul talks about this very thing. Tough conversations, conflict, is not something that was new to the 21st century. This is not a ding, 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 we are like exposed to something crazy radical in our life that has caused conflict. This has been around for all of time. Since sin entered the world, man has been dealing with hard conversations, hard relationships, hard people. And Paul's addressing this very thing. And so if you have your Bible, let's go ahead and open up to Galatians. We're going to be in Galatians chapter 6, looking at two verses tonight. If not, it's on the screen, but follow along. What you need is Paul is writing specifically to the Christians of this church of Galatia. And this is what he says. Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. And be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Share each other's burdens, and in the same way, or in this way, obey the law of Christ. 
All right, so this is what you need to know is what's going on and why Paul is writing this to this church and why this matters for our lives today. Is that church, Paul is writing this to the, to the church and to the Christians of this church and this community because they've given into a ton of different lies and disbeliefs about the gospel. You see, Paul had been with this church in Galatia. He had ministered to these people. He had seen these people come to have faith in Jesus. And honestly, it wasn't too long before that Jesus was literally among them. And so these people know Jesus. They, are, they, are amongst, they had been amongst Jesus in their lifetime. And now that Jesus has already died and crucified, and, or been crucified and been risen, Paul has been starting churches with a long number of other disciples. And he's been there and he's seen these people commit their lives to Christ, but they have fallen astray. There are people in these churches that are speaking lies. And so it's false prophets and false teachers, and the Christians are given into all sorts of sin. And so you've got not only idolatry, they're not only saying, hey, Jesus, I'm going to worship you, but I'm going to worship all these other people too. But they're also giving them themselves into adul- adultery. And so they're cheating on their spouses. They're cheating on their relationships. And they're giving themselves into a number of other sins that you can read about in this book. And so Paul is literally writing this. And that's what he's saying. He's saying, Christians, you got to wake up. You have to wake up. You've got brothers and sisters who are dying in sin over here who have professed their faith in Jesus, and you're kicked back like it's a movie to watch. Like you are letting your brothers and sisters in Christ give themselves away and waste away in sin, and you are just sitting there acting like it's no big deal. He's like, that is not what Christ came to do. It is time for you to step up. So step up, humble yourself. Say something. But saying something isn't just do enough. It's not enough to just say, Hey, you shouldn't have done that. Hey, you know, you said something. I didn't like that. I didn't think that was really nice. That's, you shouldn't do that. He's saying, that's not the answer. The answer here is to then help them. It's to give them a hand saying, hey, I know you messed up. I know you got your own struggles and you're battling. I am too. But I am here because I want to give you a hand up and say, God's got something more for you than this. And so that is why Paul is writing this. But I'm, guys, I know this is hard. Like, it's not just hard for you. It's hard for me. It's hard for all believers. It's hard for just people in general. Relationships are hard, but we live in a culture, once again, that is just so soft because we don't like having hard conversations. I mean, who does? Does anyone love just getting a really, really hard talking to by their parents? I don't know anyone who loves having a hard conversation with their parents. I don't either. But just because you have a hard conversation doesn't mean your parents don't have their, your best interest in mind. It goes for a number of things. But what happens here is that our culture like, doesn't like having hard conversations. We don't like getting into people's business. We don't want people to be upset with us. And so we avoid it at all costs. But this is, this is what Paul's saying here. He's saying, but he's not saying. He's not saying, hey, as Christians, you need to go and call out all, the, all your other Christians, all your brothers and sisters, and say, you sinned here, you sinned here, and you should be ashamed of yourself here, and you should be, you'd be judged here. He's not saying you've got to call out everyone's sin. What Paul's saying here is, hey, in humility, help your brother, help your sister, help the fellow believer fight for what's right. He's, helping, he's saying, hey, bear their burden. You've got people around you who are carrying some heavy, heavy stuff. And instead of watching them saying, man, you're, you messed up. Like, you go ahead. I, don't, I can't be around you. Ooh, 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 you said what? Are you kidding me? He did that? She, he, what? Like, we have such a culture of judgment that we are so quick to say, oh, as Christians, I can't be around that. And guys, that's another conversation. But what Paul's saying here, as fellow Christians, we need to be able to help our brothers and sisters. We need to say, hey, when they are struggling, we need to be there the first hand to lift them up and give them support and encourage them and say, hey, God has something so much more for you than what you're experiencing right here and right now. We need to help them fight for them as they fight for themselves. Guys, we're messed up. We are fallen people. We will sin. It is part of our, our, our nature of being a human being that we are sinful. And we will continue to sin. And that is why our sin is so destructive. But this is also why we desperately need accountability. This is why we need a community of believers, of brothers and sisters who love you for who you are, not for what you've done, not for where you've been, but a community of brothers and sisters who believe in Christ to support you, to say, hey, I know this is hard. I know you are struggling. I know that you've got some like battles coming your way, but you cannot do this alone. And so here, I'm going to grab your shoulder. I'm going to grab your arm and we are going to fight this together. Hey, that, that burden on your back keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And I know that is heavy. Let me help you. Those conversations are hard, guys. But this is what's desperately in need amongst other Christians. 
As Christians, we need to be accountable because this is what love is. Is that Christ loved us so much that he, he died for the broken and ugly mess that we are. Because, guys, we are the struggle bus, aren't we? Like, seriously, like, we ride the struggle bus day after day after day, and we desperately need Christ to come and redeem us. And he hates our sin. And I know hate is a strong word, but hate is the most dest- or sin is the most destructive thing on this entire planet, and Christ can't have it. And he knows that we are filled with it. And yet he said, because I love you, I'm going to redeem you. I love you so much, and I love you so much, and I love you so much, and I love you so much that I am willing to give up my life so that you don't have to stay right where you're at. Like, that is the love. But guys, like, how often do we actually apply that to our lives amongst our own Christian friends? Is that the mindset that we carry amongst our friends? Because honestly, like I said earlier, we've got friends that are struggling. Well, you know people at school. You know people in your neighborhood. It may be your family. You've got Christian friends around you who are desperately struggling. And instead, you have separated yourself saying, hey, I can't be around you. Hey, you're a bad influence on me. Hey, I can't have this in my life. You, ooh, what if people saw me with you? Rather than saying, hey, you know what? Christ loved you so much that he died for you. Let me help you. Like, I know this is an awkward conversation. I know this is a hard thing for me to talk to you about. I don't even know really the words to say. I just know Ben, that I, I love you so much as a brother, man, that, that I really believe God has something so much more for you than this that I want to help. And if you are willing, if you want to help get out of this yourself, then let me help you. Let me carry this burden with you because you can't do it alone. That is what's needed as a brother and sister in Christ. But too often we are so afraid of having hard conversations that we end up being caught and feeling alone in our sin and being trapped. And this is what I know to be true about Satan. Satan wants nothing more than to kill, steal, and destroy. Satan wants nothing more than to steal your joy. And when we, are, when we feel like we're alone, then we feel trapped. We feel like it is our battle that no one else can know. And I promise you guys that that is not the, how, we, how Christ intended our lives to be lived. That's not what he intends. And so as we look back at this passage, this is why this is so serious. This is why Paul is calling out the Christians of the church of Galatia. He's saying, guys, get with it. It is time that you guys step up. It is time that you take on the responsibility of of knowing why Christ died for you to help each other through this battle called life. But it's also important to know what Paul's not saying. It's important to know what Paul's not saying. This is what he's not saying. He's saying you are not, he's saying you are not responsible for making sure your friends make wise choices. You are not responsible for making sure that your friends are doing the right thing all the time everywhere they go. You see, you can't live your friend's life for them. Only they can make those choices. Only they can make those decisions. But if they're willing to help, if they're willing to fight for what's right, and if they're willing to fight for Christ and they're willing to step, take a step of faith, then that's where you jump in. But you can't be the policeman saying, "Hey, you did this again. You did this again. You did this again." You can't make those decisions for them. And he's not saying to help your friends when you know that you will fail in the process. And leaders, I'll let you talk about what that looks like in your small groups because I know there's such a big age gap tonight that we'll let you guys use a sermon on what kind of examples you want to give for that. But he's not saying to help your friends if you know that you too will be tempted and you too will fail because that is a lose-lose situation which doesn't help anybody. What Paul's saying here is that this is the fight. Being a Christian is the hardest thing you will ever do in your entire life and you need each other for it. You need each other's accountability. You need each other's love. You need each other's support. You can't just step on the, uh, be on the wayside just watching everyone waste away their life in sin. Because here's the thing about hard conversations, and if you're taking notes, go ahead and write it down. If you've got a phone, put it in your notes, text it to a friend, whatever it is. Because this is the whole point, is that hard conversations aren't easy. They never will be, and that's why they're hard. Hard conversations are hard for a reason. But avoiding them isn't loving. Does that make sense? Hard conversations aren't easy, but avoiding them isn't loving because what you're communicating when you are not willing to have that conversation is saying, that person's not worth it. What you're communicating is saying, like, hey, you're too far gone. You, you've done too much. I just want you to think about, what if Jesus said that about you? Because the truth is, we are all a mess. Every single one of us has messed up in our own life. And so if we're, so quick, if we're quick to say, hey, you've gone too far, I mean, imagine what Jesus would have said about you. Thankfully, that's not the case. Thankfully, we have a Jesus and we have a God who said, hey, I don't care what you did, I love you, and I'm going to die for you. 
And that needs to be our response, guys. That these hard conversations aren't going to be easy, but avoiding them isn't loving. And so I want to challenge you, as the school year's literally weeks away, and I know that looks different for each of you guys, depending on what school you're at and what your friend groups, and some of you are changing schools and all the above. Like, this is a weird season of life. Your friends are changing. But what I know is that you guys, as Christians, that you've got Christians who are struggling. How are you loving them? What conversations are you having with them? What accountability is at play? Because you can't do this alone. And here's the thing about love is that love pushes you to talk about difficult things. Because if you're not willing to have conversations, you're not really loving. And so as we go to close small groups, I just want you to think about this. I want you to think about how am I loving my friends? What am I doing with my friends that truly is pointing them towards Jesus? What accountability do I have in my life? Do I have people who are asking the hard questions? Do I have people that are willing to to risk the relationship for the sake of Jesus? And are you that friend to somebody else? So leaders, like discuss those. I know those aren't in your question guides, but I would love for you guys to talk about that in your breakouts because these are important. This is important stuff. Accountability is huge. And so as we go to groups, I'm going to pray for us. I'm going to pray that this is a really sweet time. Because guys, before we bow your heads and everything, I want you to hear this is that small groups is where this really comes alive. This, there's no better place than to have a, a group of brothers and sisters that are, like, that are truly tied together, that are committed to God's word, and fighting for each other, even in the hardest of times. Small groups are where life happens. Small groups is where life transformation takes place because you are open and honest with one another. And if you won't do that, then you, you really do miss out. And I would hate for that to be your, your, your thing. I would, I would hate for you to miss out on, on tr- brothers and sisters who are going to say, hey, I know that's hard. Hey, let me pray for you. Hey, let's spend time to get, help, let me help you carry that burden. Because I know you're not, I can't say that, but I, I know it's harder to find that in other places. And this is why small group community is so important to your, to your walk with Jesus. And so think about that. Think about that for yourself as you leave here and as you go into your small groups. Think about what is your part to play in this? What, how are you going about what, what we just looked at in Scripture? So if you'll bow your heads, I'm going to pray. God, thank you for tonight. Thank you for the joy that is knowing your word. And I thank you for uh, speaking truth through your word, God. And I thank you for, for all of these students here who are so uh, committed to, to looking and learning about your word, God. God, I genuinely pray that as we go to groups that you will use this time that you will use this, this time with their, their, their leaders, God, to be open and honest about what their life looks like, what kind of things that they're willing to talk about, what kind of things they're willing to have, what kind of conversations they're willing to have with their friends. God, love changes everything. And so I pray that these students will experience your love and life change that comes with it. We love you, Lord. Amen.